Do you want to know how to take advantage of downward moves in stocks? Well, one such approach is using put options. I'm Dave Whitmore, senior strategist at E-Trade. So let's talk about that. Buying a put is a so-called directional position in option speak, which just means that its success depends on the underlying stock moving in a specific direction. In the case of a put, the stock moving down. So the put buyer is speculating that a stock is going to decline. Simple enough. But when using options, a trader is faced with a number of choices in a big menu of ranges of risk and reward. Therefore, our goal in our presentation here is for you to learn how to approach that task strategically. Four sections. First, we'll review some essential facts and relationships about options. Then we'll move on to, first things first, the underlying stock. And why is it that you want to use a put option for this stock? From that, we will move to the step of picking out our strike price and our expiration. And then having done that, we will work that trade through a hypothetical series of scenarios. So an option, long and short, rights and obligations. On one side of an option is the person who buys it. That person owns the option and is said to be long the option. The other side of the option is the writer of the option, the person who sells an option that he doesn't own, is writing it and is said to be short that option. An option is a traded contract, and both of those words are important. First, the word contract. This is not a piece of paper that people are signing and sending back. There's no attorneys involved, but it is a contractual arrangement between the rights and the obligations of the parties, the writer and the owner. It is freely traded on an exchange, not unlike the New York Stock Exchange or other exchanges. And the process of the contractual terms all occurs through a central organization called the Options Clearing Corporation. When you own an option, you pay its market price. We call that the premium. You pay that to the writer of the option. When you buy an option, you have a right to do something. And if and when you choose to do so, you may exercise that right. The other side of the position has an obligation. That obligation may be assigned to them and they may have to carry through on that obligation if an exercise notice is assigned to them. That all occurs through the OCC and your brokerage firm. And then finally, we have two kinds of options, call options, which give the owner the right to buy and the writer the obligation to sell, and put options, which are the topic of this production, which give the owner the right to sell and the writer the obligation to buy. Okay, one more point we want to review, and that is this notion of the option price or the option premium. This is a market-determined price, supply and demand of traders who come together and a... a Bid and an ask and a last price is determined. That option price has two components to it. One part is called the intrinsic value of the option and the other part is called the time value of the option. That's actually sometimes called the extrinsic value. Intrinsic value is simple. It's just the difference between the current price of the stock and the strike price of the option. It's the in the money amount is the intrinsic value of that option. Simple arithmetic value. Time value is a little more dynamic and it really is the part of an options price that is um, uh, dynamic. The first component of time value is how much time is there in the option. As each day goes by, there's less time. The other primary component of time value is the underlying volatility of the stock. Two stocks, same price, but with differing volatilities, the more volatile stock will have higher option prices than the lesser volatility stock. Other components of time value are prevailing rates of interest and the dividends of the stock. These are not really sort of catalysts for price change that a trader would be looking for. You should just know that, the, that these elements are embedded in that time value number. All right, so 
what's the good and the bad of using put options to speculate? Well, first the pros, and the first one is specific to options. Generally, you get leverage. You're able to control more with less money in this, this idea of a levered return over the movement of the underlying stock is a big part of the attraction to options. The other important attraction is that you now have a defined risk position. The most that you can lose is what you pay. And then finally, you have a wide range of choice, trade-offs between the risk in the position you want to create, the amount of reward that you are reaching for or hoping for, and then probabilities of both of those events. On the other side, the first one, which is sort of unique to puts, is that if the stock rises, it now can, and most of the time will, hurt your position in three different ways. First, price is moving against you. So if the stock is rising, your put value is going down. Most likely, it's certainly not going up. Time is also um, moving one step further toward uh, expiration. Volatility, though, is, is because when stocks rise, their volatilities typically fall. And so in a modestly rising stock, moving against you, time dissipating, and volatility declining, the put position can be hurt more than a call position might be in a similar move. Puts are also generally more expensive than calls. This is what's called skew, put skew. It comes about because in the institutional world, there's a natural demand um, for put buying because it's protective. So in certain circumstances, institutional managers will uh, purchase puts to protect positions that they have. So it adds this natural demand for puts. The other side of it is that there's sort of a natural demand to sell calls um, because that can generate income on a portfolio. So both of those factors have a tendency to create this price skew. And then finally, as is the case with most options, you have a limited time to profit and you face the possibility of a worthless expiration. Okay, that's our review. Now let's really turn to our focus here. And we'll start with thinking about the underlying stock. You think the stock's going lower. What? Well, why? Because the why is the first step in how you think about your strategy. Is it something fundamental, like an earnings report? Many option traders are attracted to earnings periods because of the volatility that's present. Um, or is it something on the chart? Whatever your answer is, that's got to be part of the backdrop of how you think about this trade. So let me just sort of give you a couple four instances of what I mean. Fundamentals with options usually come down to either product announcements or um, uh, product statistics uh, or uh, earnings. So let's say you're following this stock and it reports earnings next month and you have a suspicion that they'll fall short of their earnings. That's sort of a reasonable rational and sound backdrop for a put purchase. Um, and when I say many strategies, there are others. For instance, you could use a put spread. That's beyond the topic here. It's covered in some of our other sessions. But the point is, is that this is a logical and rational backdrop. You have a specific event in the future, a date of that. You know how much time to consider for your trade. And now you can use approaches for uh, selecting strikes and, uh, and expirations as we're going to work through. What if, on the other hand, it's the fact that it reports earnings this week? Well, really, the same thing. We've just now compressed the time period. But you do have a discrete date to work around. And that allows you to be much more um, precise in fashioning a strategy. So, but you should be aware that um, earnings week can be extremely volatile. And another thing that sometimes happens is the implied volatility of options will get crushed following the announcement. And so a lot of options can be deflated on the heels of an announcement. So that's sometimes why folks um, want to trade into and then out of an option 
before the announcement is made. At any rate, two backdrops that sort of make sense. What if you think the stock is garbage and you think eventually it's going to go belly up? Well, in this situation, I'm not so sure options are a reasonable approach. You don't have a time frame here. It could be very open-ended. Um, so rather, you probably want something that you can hold a long time. Shorting the stock would be one approach to that. Not that you can always hold a short position for a long time, but it, it doesn't have an expiration date. Or you can use long-term options. They're sometimes called leaps. You may have heard of them. Um, uh, they can be very expensive, is all that I'll say. When you look at options that have a year or two years of time to expiration, they're pretty high priced. What if it's something on the chart? Like, look, that stock is tanking. I'm going to buy some puts. Well, it's certainly a momentum trade to do that. Um, just know that while that stock is tanking, its volatility is increasing and its price is moving in the direction that is making puts more expensive. So you are going to be faced with um, pricey trades. Another technical setup would not necessarily point to such pricey options. And that is, I'm calling here, the stock is up against resistance. So what I mean by that is the stock has been moving up most recently. And the price area where it is right now is where we would expect resistance to be. That could be from a moving average. That could be from a trend line, whatever the reason is. In that situation, remember, the stock has been rising, so there hasn't been a lot of speculative put buying. So they might be rather quiet and not all that expensive. The other thing with this strategy or this um, reasoning is that you may need more time for this to play out because stocks can bounce around against that resistance. Um, here we have a, sort of the other extreme from the stock is tanking and it's the stock is overbought, meaning it's probably been rallying really strongly and is into um, overbought technical territory. Um, in that situation, you would be trading for a pullback and pullbacks like that usually are quick and swift. Um, so this is certainly an opportunity. Um, but then the other thing to be aware of is just reaching overbought does not necessarily mean that the stock is a signal to turn down because stocks can remain overbought or oversold for an extended period of time. So at any rate, different lenses or points of view and how they can be used to frame an approach to an option selection. So let's look at a chart and set up um, uh, an example of a trade and then start exploring some option prices. So here I have a stock, XYZ Corporation, very long-term chart, and it's in a downtrend. You can see lower highs all across the chart. The green moving average line, which is a long-term moving average, is trending down, as is the blue line. Um, we've got a stock in a downtrend, and if you look more closely, you can see that it has jumped up. Um, and in the pre preceding three bars, the stock's rallied meaningfully right up toward that resistance line from the moving average and the downtrend. If we look at the daily chart on that and zoom in a little closer, you can see that jump that's occurred um, on the right-hand side of the chart. The chart provides, using some simple technical chart analysis techniques, three logical downside price targets that if, if our hypothesis was that this stock got overbought way up here and it's pulling back sharply to some place where it might bounce, there's three places on this chart that we could identify as that. One would be to pull back to this line, which had been resistance and then the stock broke through it. And one of the one common technical condition is for a stock to pull back to what was resistance and then bounce off of that. So that's one target. The other two targets are both moving averages that are below us right here. And so this would also be a, a common occurrence for once price becomes extended away from a moving average, we often see it start to pull back. So what we have here is a stock that gives us three possible target prices that we can compare and decide and select on, which we'll look at some strike prices coming up. But then the second part of the question, and this becomes a little fuzzier, 
is how much time do you need? So this is sort of a question of like, what do you, what is the expect, expected rate of descent, angle of descent? Are we making a trade where we think it's going to pull back super sharp and come straight down vertical in maybe one or two or three bars here? Well, that would be a two or three day trade. Or do we think it might grind lower, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, until it you know, takes a little longer to reach a time frame? We need to think about this this way because time is such an important step in the selection of our, of our option. So the other thing to remember, and this is really important when it comes to puts is this old adage in the market that stocks are said to take the stairs up and the elevator down or is it really more like this well the point is and you can see this on a stock chart is that the angle of ascent when a stock is moving up is typically gentler than the angle of descent when a stock declines. Stocks tend to decline faster than they rise. So for a put buyer, this sets up an important situation. It is It probably points to the notion that moving in and out of a put is a little more nimbler of a trade. Because remember, the long-term market trend is up. So you're trading against that and just know that down moves can be sharp, swift, and quickly reversed. Okay, so picking the option. This starts at the options chain. That's the big menu that gives you your, uh, your choices. The various expirations are available across the top row here, this ribbon. You'll notice I've got two selected, these check marks. And we also show you in the display how many days um, until expiration. The available strike prices are down the center, and then calls are on the left and puts are on the right. Important to know that available expirations and strike prices are all determined by the exchanges. Not by E-Trade, not by the company, but by the exchanges. And the exchanges choose to list a stock's options and then choose what expirations and strike prices will be offered. And you'll see a wide range. Here you can see on our stock, there, there are strike prices at each $1 increment. In others, sometimes you'll see a 50 cent increment difference. In others, it'll be five point differences. Again, all a function of decisions by the exchanges. So when it comes to time, a rule of thumb, and it's sort of a pair of rules of thumb, are first start by doubling the amount of time that you think the trade needs. So look at your target price, use your chart work. If you think the trade needs 30 days, you should right away think about having 60 days of life in your option. And then finally, also, we want to try to avoid holding our options all the way into the last 20 days of life. And I'll show you the reason for that. But one remark here, we often, when talking about options and in teaching them, we talk about the outcome at expiration. What would be the value of this option if this occurred and at expiration it was this? And we'll use scenarios such as that. But understand, you do not have to hold an option to expiration. You do not ever have to exercise an option. In fact, most experienced option traders move into a position and out of it while it still has ample life. And we'll see that in some examples. So let me give you the argument why we want to avoid those last 20 days or so. So here I have a chart of theoretical put prices. Notice in the upper right corner, we are looking at a hypothetical stock that is $50, and we are using an options pricing tool to calculate the theoretical value of an option with a $50 strike, so it's exactly at the money, 
no intrinsic value. The underlying stock has a 35% volatility and the prevailing interest rates is 2%. So the first bar here shows us that if that option had 125 days of life till expiration, its value would be 425. One contract would cost $425. If we were to price that option and instead of 125 days, it had 115 days, the theoretical price of the option would be 4% lower. It would be 405. So we can view this as ev evidence that this time premium dissipates or decays as expiration approaches. So we can follow a few different relationships here and see this. At 95 days, Compared to 85 days, the option is 6% lower. A 10-day period now brought the time premium down by 6%. This 10-day period brought, brings the time premium down by 8%. 16% here and a whopping 42% when an option goes from 15 days to 5 days. So this is why we say this area here, this last month, where the acceleration of time decay becomes um, strong. As an option holder, we want to avoid holding into that period. We want to buy an option out in the left side of this, hold it for a while, and trade out of it when the move occurs. So now I want to introduce one of what are called the Greeks. It's called Delta, and it's a common column available in option chains, and it's certainly one that you can use in your option chains, um, and uh, both in Power E-Trade and in the website. So first, I took prices for some options. We're using our stock XYZ Corp, 69 and 3 quarters. There were 49 days to expiration. A 70 strike price option was $5.30, or it would cost us $530 to purchase it. And here are the prices of four other strike prices. 67.50 was four dollars. The 65 was 280. The 62.50 was 180. The 60 is a dollar ten. Delta for the 70 is 0 0.5018. The definition of delta or the interpretation of delta can be in, in, lo looked at in two important ways. And the first one is as what we'll call an expected price move. What we mean by that is delta tells us that if the underlying stock moves $1 immediately, the option should change by half of that, 0 0.5018 of that. In other words, $50.18. So, importantly, I said immediately because the assumption is nothing else has changed. So, now, certainly time has gone somewhere because it would at least be one second later, but it's a theoretical concept that we're talking about here. And I can fill in the rest of the deltas. First thing you'll notice is that the deltas are lower as the, as the strike prices are further and further out of the money. So that's an interesting relationship. It tells us that an at-the-money option will move dollar in a dollar amount greater than an out-of-the-money option. But let's look at it in a different way. Let's compare the option price to the gain that would occur. First one. The option goes from 530 to 580. That's a gain of $50 or 9.4%. The 6750 goes up $42 for a gain of 10%. And you can see below as we go down to the 65, the 6250, the 60, we've got greater percentage gains. So what we see here is that even though the deltas are lower in a dollar amount, as a percentage of the move, they're higher, which underscores the notion of the leverage that these out-of-the-money options can give us. So that would seem to be 
an attraction to the out-of-the-money, lesser expensive options, and many option traders are attracted to those. But let's look at it from another point of view. And now we're going to use delta as a different estimate. Now we're going to use delta as an estimate of probability. So instead of delta representing $50, now we're going to say, and this is the other typical interpretation of delta, is that it tells us the probability that the option will be in the money at expiration. Okay? Be in the money. But let's think about that more closely. Remember, an option can be in the money by one penny, which means it has one cent of intrinsic value, and if it's at expiration, it has no time value. So therefore, it doesn't mean that the position is profitable to you. What it really does mean is what is the likelihood that the option will expire worthless? And that's the reciprocal of the number. So the first one has a 50% chance of being in the money at expiration, which means it has a 50% chance of being out of the money at expiration. And if it's out of the money at expiration, it's worthless. So the 6750 therefore has a 58% chance of expiring worthless. I think you can anticipate the direction our numbers are going to go. So that 60 put, which we looked at and said, oh, look at the leverage we get from price. Yes, that's true, but we also have an 83% chance that it expires worthless. So you are faced with these two trade-offs. The leverage that's available and the probability of loss. So when you're making the pick, go through this sequence. What is my price objective for the stock? What is my rationale for it? Why and where do I think it's going? How much time should I allow? What is reasonable? What would be aggressive? What would be less aggressive? Think about those and then look at various expirations in, that, in relationship to that. Once you've got a few candidates, now you can start looking at probabilities. And then finally, and we haven't talked about it much, but it's true in all things, pay attention to liquidity. Um, focusing on actively traded, widely held stocks that have a lot of trading volume, you'll find is much easier on option trades. So let's put a hypothetical trade through I think I have five or six scenario outcomes here. So let's first set up the trade. We've got our stock, WXYZ. It's 69.50. We're going to buy one put, the 67.50 strike. It's going for four bucks. We have 49 days to expiration. So this is an out of the money put, a little bit out of the money not way out of the money, a little bit below the current price. Let's go through the value of the option. Well, it's got a market value of $4. What's its intrinsic value? None, because it's an out of the money option. Therefore, the market value is all time value. Remember, market price is the time value and the intrinsic value. And if we know intrinsic value is zero, then the time value is the market value of it. Scenario one, the stock falls to 65 in one week. So we now have a stock at 65 bucks. We have 42 days to expiration. What's the option price likely to be? And we don't know for sure, but I wanna walk you through the logic of how you can expect to see option prices move. First things first. Intrinsic value. Does it have intrinsic value? Yes, it does. The stock is 65. It's a 67.50 put, so it's two and a half points in the money. Therefore, $2.50 of intrinsic value. What about time value? So a week has gone by, which means time value is going to go down. How much? We don't know. Um, we can estimate using some of the some other measures, but let's just work this through um, uh, mentally here. Um, probably also with a 
6% decline in a week, probably the volatility of the stock has risen a little bit as well. So we've got some time decay and increasing volatility. So in that situation, we might see the time value to put be very similar to what it was when we bought it. So let's say it's $3.90 instead of $4. Well, that means that the market value of the, of the put's going to be $6.40. And we're up $2.40 on the trade. And we can put that into dollars showing here. What if we sold to put it 640? We paid four for it, therefore we made 240. There's a 65 cents per contract um, trade on options. So there is a dollar thirty of cost there. Your net gain is 60% on a six percent move in the underlying stock, and that illustrates the leverage that attracts option traders. A, a multiple percentage-wise of the move in the stock in the, in the put. All right, scenario two is the stock's 65, but even faster. It's 65 the next day. So all of our facts now, rather than we have more time left, we have 48 days to expiration. Let's go through the value of it. Intrinsic value is the same. Remember, that's just the arithmetic between the strike price and the current price of the stock. Time value is going to be different, though. Here, less time has gone by, just one day, and no doubt the volatility is increased. So therefore, you might have one day later, the time value of the put might be $4.50, which would mean that the market value of the option would be in the $7 range, which would mean you would now be up $3 on the investment of 4 for a gain of 75% on the 6% move. So an illustration of the value of time. The quicker the move occurs, the, 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 the better your return generally is. What if it goes to 65 like we were thinking, but it takes all the way to expiration? Well, this is the unfortunate illustration of the other side. Now, at this situation, take a look what we've got. We're at expiration. And now let me clarify what I mean by at, at expiration. We are on the last trading day, maybe in the last hour. And there will be trading in these options. But it's mostly going to be trading with market makers. Because there's not going to be very many people speculating to buy a put that has an hour to go. But a market maker is a different animal. So in this situation with a put that has 45 minutes of life left, say, and has $2.50 of intrinsic value, you're probably going to see a bid price of maybe 240. And that means you could sell this put at 240 and cash out. Why would the market maker be doing that? Well, the market maker is able to immediately buy from you at 240, exercise the option, and sell the stock and capture that 10 cents of, of uh, intrinsic value that you're giving up by being willing to sell um, uh, instead of exercising the option yourself. Because it is important to remember that it's not your only choice. Yes, you're down on the trade. Selling the put is not your only choice. One would be to exercise the put and short the stock and then be short the stock at 67.50. A second one, second choice you would have would be to roll the put. Rolling an option means simply liquidating one that you have and using that money to buy another option. So it's a two-sided trade. Sell this one and buy another one. So those are your choices. What if it's 68 two weeks later? So here is an awkward situation for an options trader because it's gone in the direction you thought, not as quickly as you had imagined, and some time's gone by, but you still have some life in the option. So what might you be faced with here? Well, the intrinsic value of the put with a 67.50 strike price is zero. 
there is going to be time value left. We still have 35 days. How much? Well, the volatility has probably dampened a little bit. So I'm going to say maybe 325, which would mean the market value is going to be about 325, which would mean you're down 75 cents on the contract. You bought it for four. So you have a $325 option. It costs you four. Or you're down 76 bucks. You're down 20%. And all that's happened is a little time has gone by and the stock has drifted 2% lower. So the leverage works the other way. What about 67.49 at expiration? Why would I choose that odd number? Because it illustrates and underscores an important fact. So the stock's 67.49 at expiration. There's no time left. It's in the money by a penny. So it has intrinsic value. What about time value? No, none. There would be no bid for this option. If there was 30 minutes to go in the market and you were looking at this, um, the quote on it would be no bid and probably offered at a nickel. In other words, a market maker would be saying, you want to buy this option? I'll sell it to you for a nickel, maybe 10 cents. But at any rate, um, no, no bid, no value, no market value. Therefore, it's a loss. It's a 100% loss. But there's an important caveat here. This Central Clearing Corporation, the Options Clearing Corporation, the OCC, will automatically exercise any option that's in the money by one penny or more. So in this situation, OCC would come to E-Trade and say, we're exercising this option, unless E-Trade said, no, do not exercise. E-Trade would say, do not exercise for one of two reasons. Either you told us, do not exercise, by calling us on expiration, right, at the, right on that market day, after the close is fine. Or we say, do not exercise because your account cannot handle it. It doesn't have the buying power or the funds or the stock to carry out the exercise. It, what that means is if your account can, then it will be automatically exercised. And at that point, you're just going to be at risk for the stock. You'll be long, or you'll be short the stock. So in other words, don't hold an option all the way. If it's right at the money like this, make sure that if it ticks into the money that, and you don't want an exercise to occur, you give us a phone call. What if the stock goes to 80? Well, this is, you know, it went completely the wrong way. It's going to be worth zero. You're going to be facing that 100% loss. But the important thing to remember here is that had you shorted the stock instead, your loss would have been much greater. You would be down over $1,000 um, had you simply shorted the stock instead of the option trade. So there's the, the controlled risk of an option versus a short stock position. So look, you have a bunch of moving parts in an option trade. Think about them in sequence when planning your trade. Start with your target price. Then consider time periods. What's an aggressive time period? What's a conservative one? Take a look at probabilities. Start recognizing the probability relationships. And then finally, make sure you check your liquidity before you wade into the waters.